Anyway, Faye, how are you today? I'm good, Paula. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Look, before we jump into our topic, um, I'd love to ask you and know more about how your journey into early learning started. Yes, so it's it's a good question, um, and I, I, I just probably go right back to um, when I was growing up. So I am one of seven, so I'm the third youngest in my yes. family, and I grew up in the far south coast of New South Wales on in Yuan country. Not that I knew it was Yuan country back then. We only knew the white fellas' history, not the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' history. So got to learn about that obviously after I left Eden, but. Um, what, what I, I always knew I wanted to be an early childhood teacher from high school. Don't ask me why. But, and I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, so teaching in the first year of, of primary school. Um, may have been influenced by my amazing kindergarten teacher and some of my other teachers. Uh, but what, what I was encouraged by my family, they encouraged me to go to university. They encouraged us to seek out educational opportunities that they didn't get to have uh, when they were growing up and 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 had come to come to Australia in the late 1960s as as 10 pound poms. So uh, they really encouraged me. And so that social justice and, and importance of having access to high quality education has been something that I think is really um, a foundation of mine from, from a very young age. So I was actually the first in my family to go to university. So it was pretty scary. Um, and I had to leave Eden, this very small country town and go up to Canberra, which I thought was huge. It'd be big it really it's just a big country town itself but it felt huge um <laughs> my two younger sisters followed me wow. and they came to uni as well so we started a bit of a um started a changing in our family in terms of going to university um but reflecting on my journey which started I can't believe it 33 years ago when I started teaching at 20 um, I think the things that have uh, really impacted on, on my journey are around the diversity of the experiences and also enjoying those moments where I find places or places or centres or organisations that get me, that uh, I'm able to connect with, and also about looking for those opportunities and getting out of my comfort zone, which I had to do right from, you know, when I was 18 and move move out of my small country town and, and pursue my um, passion as a teacher. Interestingly, yeah. as I thought I would be a kindergarten teacher, that's actually the only role I've never ever had <laughs> in my teaching career, which is which is interesting. And again, speaks to <laughs> ideas and then worlds and life and choices and options take us in different different directions. So when I was in my final year of my teaching uh, qualification in Canberra, I worked three days a week in a childcare centre, and um, it changed my whole perspective. And I then fell in love basically with long day care and so my teaching in a rural primary school in kindy was out the window and I stayed in Canberra and um, was uh, took up the opportunity to take the preschool teacher job when I finished my qualification and uh, worked in this long long day community-based long day care centre uh, for two to five year old children and it was a melting pot it was a centre in Narrabunda Canberra people think Canberra is um quite advantaged but there are lots of disadvantages and pockets of disadvantage in Canberra and Narrabunda at that time was one of those pockets and so we had lots of families who who had complex issues you know things like drug and alcohol or domestic violence I also then had the diplomats children I also had the the, the blue collar and the white collar family so it really was yeah. this big melting pot and again probably spoke to my social justice perspective about the importance of um, bringing children together to learn and to think and to to really encourage them to be what they can be um, so interestingly though ask my leader I was going to ask you, in that melting pot of so many diversity, diversified, is that the word, diverse, diverse children and their backgrounds, did you notice with the children that really it didn't matter where they were from, they were friends anyway? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's about giving them the skills, their social and emotional skills. And so sometimes children don't always have the, the tools because they may not have had those experiences in their own home. And so it was about ensuring that they had those tools so that they could make those friends and connect and, and feel like that they belonged. Because we know that belonging is such an important part of any human being. Yes. Yep. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wow. How exciting. So from there in Narrabunda. What happened next? So I was in that role for three years and the what happened next? So I was in that role for three years and then the director took on another role in another centre in that same organisation and he said to me, you should be, you should apply for the director's role. And I was like, no, I'm very happy being a teacher. And he's like, no, no, I, I think you should apply. So I did, even though it was a huge jump out of my comfort zone, I just felt like I was starting to get to be a good preschool teacher. Um, so I, I was definitely an accidental leader. It wasn't something that I had pursued. It, it, it found me. Um, and that's a bit of my story. The people who see my capabilities and before I probably do sometimes, like in my career, I've been tapped on the shoulder to do something and I wouldn't have necessarily put myself up for that. So those mentors and people that have encouraged me to believe in myself and my capacities. So he did that. I got the job. And so I took on um, the director's role. And that was, uh, I was very young. I was only 23. I was, uh, you know, in a centre with staff ranging from my age right through to, you know, closer to 60. So even that whole understanding of how to manage staff when you're a young leader and and develop those um, leadership strategies. So that really informed my passion for leadership then and to really stretch myself and think about what else can I do to learn to be a good director and make sure that I'm working and getting the best out of the staff and that we're having a high quality experience for the children and families. So, yeah, so I did and that. And so then how did then you I... end up coming to where we are now almost? Where where did that lead you through to? Yeah, so I then moved to Sydney. I, I did some travelling and then I moved to Sydney and I, again, pushed myself out of my comfort zone and I joined, I, I was the director of a brand new private centre, so I jumped out of community-based and into private. Uh, it was a mum and dad uh, centre. They were passionate about social justice, so, again, I found my fit. I found some uh, my tribe. And so that was a challenge because it was zero to five. I'd never, ever had to have any experience with infants before then. And we had to build the centre from scratch. It, had, it hadn't even been finished. The building hadn't even been finished when I was appointed. I was walking through a building site as I was appointed as director. Uh, so we had to, I had to recruit all the staff, <laughs> recruit the children, recruit the families, you know, build the centre up. And, um, and so... While I was doing that, I realised I still needed to to learn more. So I went and went back and did my master's. And when I did my master's, I actually fell in love with research. I didn't ever think that I would be a professor of early childhood. You know, I was well an associate professor. I'm not a professor yet. <laughs> um, I always <laughs> thought next? I was going to be working with, you know, children and families all my life. And I had just gone to do the master's to help me become a better director and a better leader of our service. So, so that inspired me to submit my to to enrol in a PhD. So, some of the lecturers that were at the Western Sydney Uni, where I was doing my masters, encouraged me to to take on the research units and to enrol in a PhD. So that's what happened. Wow! And and from there, really, what you're doing is with your passion with early learning, you're doing it from from a research perspective, and that's our future. That's that's. Mm that's our next steps and you know the work you're doing there um helps now and and the next generation or, or or three um to do the best we can do for our children um and their children of course now um with this team is it the are you working in the same team as you had been like through that research unit i work with uh, quite a diverse group of people in research so I work with people that are at Macquarie University where I am um, but I also work across other universities so uh, we have um, the quality improvement project that we just recently did a couple of years ago that was with also Susan Irvine from Professor Susan, Susan Irvine from QUT, Professor Lenny Barblett from Edith Cohen University so way over in WA so um, wow. it, it's yes. really good to, to work with uh, other early childhood colleagues in other universities so that you are not also just in your New South Wales bubble because that 
you know, most of my experience is in ACT in New South Wales. So um, sometimes you think that what happens in that state happens in every state and territory, and it's very different across Australia, even though we now have a national framework. We still have quite diverse um, ways of delivering early childhood services across Australia. Yeah, absolutely. I But I see it from my role between WA, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and then in the middle, everyone does something different because of the way their communities are mm. is is how I see that um, as well. So with when you're talking about doing that um, quality improvement paper, um, that was a few years back now and that was just recently released. Is that right? That's correct. So we've... The, the report's been on the ASEQA website for a couple of years and I can send you that link to go into the podcast. But we're now just starting oh, to Oh, that would be great. Yeah, so the publications always take a little bit longer because you have to go through a very rigorous peer review process in journals. So they're all starting to appear now um, and we just recently uh, just put one up around the, the project. Um, and it's been okay. able to now disseminate around what are the things that influence services that want to move from uh, working towards to meeting or exceeding. Oh, wow. Now, with that, um, you talk about the team and how diverse that team was across Australia. How did you find working on that, um, that paper? Yeah, so we do obviously a lot of things virtually and via email and Teams and Zooms and COVID, I mean, when we first did this ASEQA project, it was before COVID. Uh, so I got to go and visit in in phase three of our project, we went and actually shadowed centres, so uh, 15 centres across Australia and spent two days with each, um, all of the staff and talked to them about their practices and the strategies that they used. Uh, and I was really lucky to go to Canberra and Tasmania. Um, so, so we but even back then we did a lot of Zoom and a lot of Teams and just a lot of email. And now that's just the way of life. Like that's the way teams work across Australia um, in terms of not flying in and, you know, losing two days of productivity yep. of work for a couple of hours meeting. We can now just do it and stay within our workspaces as we do it. And, and I find it a really effective way of connecting across Australia now in terms of that. And um, you mentioned um, that, you know, you you all went to these different centres. Is there any particular centre or any particular, no, don't name them necessarily, or you can if you want to, um, any particular practice that you saw that you really went, oh, wow, that's amazing? Yeah, I think for me, the two centres I went to, one had gone from working towards to exceeding and the other one had gone from working towards to meeting. And what was really clear in both even though they got a different rating, was that the commitment from the educators, the, the role of the leader, and that was found in our, in our uh, three phases, the role of the director, the educational leader, the approved provider, how they all worked together um, to ensure that staff and educators could actually have the time to focus on what's important around quality and how to interact and what we should be programming and the experiences that we should be doing. Uh, so that was a that was a big part of the two settings that I went to around that commitment to support the the educational leader and the director to be able to impact the quality of their centre. And of course, that's then um, obvious with their increase in rating. And mm -hmm. um, do you find though when and when they're doing these, you know, they're making this um, joint team effort? Do you see? Um, a shift overall of everyone's behaviour that would even impact the children? Yeah, so and really interestingly what we found, so in phase one we just looked at services statistically and then in phase two we analysed 60 quality improvement plans and their assessment and rating plans so we're all de-identified across Australia uh, but what was interesting in the QUIPS and the uh, A&R uh, reports was that you could see the services that had uh, they were focusing on across the centre. So maybe they had two rooms, three rooms, five rooms. It didn't matter what size they were. But if they were really thinking about the program across the centre, not just in their own individualised room, you, you could get that real sense of a whole collaborative team approach. And, and philosophy was really important there. We could see those 
centres that had a philosophy that was uh, invested by the staff, that was contextualised to their setting, you know, not a generalised philosophy. It made sense for their setting. The uh, approved provider's vision, you could see the vision was really specific. And so when you could see that um, move away from being a real kind of generalised uh, philosophy or a generalised vision to actually something that is important for this setting and developed by those educators and staff in that setting, you could see the commitment to quality was there then because it was a shared collective. Yes, and there's that buy-in, isn't there? There's that mm-hmm. there's that ownership of what they're doing and there's that staff leadership. So rather than, you know, rather they're seeing as a... As, once again, actually, we go back to that word belonging, isn't it? It's all about belonging to the team, to the centre, and feeling part of um, part of what you do, um, which I'm sure is what you saw with those services that you went to and how they improved in that. Um, can I ask you, um, in those centres when you were when you were working in them, did they ask for advice and things from you as well? Were they very keen to learn more about? Uh, what you're doing and and is that what you were you know able to do with them so we we didn't go in to to give advice we went in to be told what they were doing so we we kind of flipped it and said we want to you know you're a success story you've gone from working towards to meeting or working towards to exceeding we want to know what you did that allowed you to move from that rating so that we can share those stories and those strategies and the and the factors and the and the supports that you developed so that we can share that with the sector in our reports and in our in our publications so that others right. can learn from you so we actually went in with that mindset not that we're going to tell you what we think we actually wanted them to tell us what yeah. they yeah. thought yeah yeah yeah. Right. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. And that. Yeah. And so along the way, um, were they asking you? They obviously asking you questions as well. Um, it, it getting your expertise. I mean, I I certainly would knowing I had an associate professor professor in my centre. <laughs> so so interestingly, not so much as of the two days, but I still stay in contact regularly with the Canberra Centre, for example. The director and I have often have chats about different things and the approved provider as well. So it's probably been a more um, organic um, mentoring space, but after we we did the visit and 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 I'm not the only one. There were eight of us that went to those centres and I know that the eight of us that um, are still in contact with some of the centres who wanted to follow up. or Which is a great outcome. Yeah, yeah. And they might say, yeah. Faye, I need which, some, which you know, the... articles on this. And so then I'll find it and send it to them, that sort of thing. Or what is your advice on this? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> and that, that I think is a really lovely I... outcome of that project. Yes, I, I that, and, and also, you know, you've been a director and a teacher. That I've never done that. But from my, um, just from my looking at it, when you're in a centre as a director, not that you're alone, but you are sort of in your own little office, in your own little world. So having you and your team sort of as that mentoring um, help would would be great because of that yes. shared knowledge and they can think, I've got a, I've got a bit of a backup. I've got someone to help me here. Um, and, and that I'm sure would make make a more positive experience for that director as well, having having done that paper. Um, even though it was only, you know, a, a project as such, the ongoing um, uh, benefits for those services would, would be huge. Absolutely. And and we know that uh, directing or leading can be a very lonely job. So it is really important that directors and, and leaders in, in educational settings do have those uh, networks that they can rely on outside of their setting because sometimes they do have to vent about something and you can't do that inside or uh, this is troubling me is that something that you you know have you faced that before and so having those um other people that uh, you're connected to outside of your setting are really nice ways of having to be able to bounce off and think about what is it that i could do differently maybe maybe or in terms of creating that supportive workplace for their for their staff and educators yeah, absolutely. I can, I, and it's and 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 outside of their workspace as well. So it's not their boss or their area manager or their approved provider. It's a different perspective altogether, which which is awesome. Um, 
we've been talking bits and pieces across the paper. Is there anything, um, like, can you just give us an overview um, of what you and the team found? Um, and I know we've spoken bits and pieces. Um, just, you know, the, the purpose and the findings um, and any interesting data that you might like to share with us. Yeah. Well, I think some of the things, because as it was three stages and, you know, the first phase was all statistical. It was a big data set, about 2,000 2, centres. And there were things around um, if you centres that were more likely to improve from that working towards to meeting were more likely to be not-for-profit community-based services or non-government services than a not-for-profit, for, for, so then for-profit services. Services that were pro large providers, so you had, you know, more than 10 or 15 centres in your organisation, regardless of whether you were for-profit or not-for-profit, you were more likely to uh, move to working towards or a meeting so I and I think they make sense because if I'm part of a larger organization I've got more people to tap in if I'm a standalone center I, I really have don't have as many resources so it makes sense that those um, impacted on whether a center could move from working towards to meeting the other things around working towards to exceeding though that was also around um, centers that were uh, again those large providers um, also yep. more likely to be the not-for-profit services that moved from working towards to exceeding. Uh, if they were in a larger centre, so if they had 60 or more uh, approved places for children, they were more likely to, to move to exceeding. Again, it makes sense, more staff, you're a bigger centre, you can draw on more of, of, of your educators to help your resource and to think about what you're doing. Uh, if they changed ownership during that time, they were less likely to, to move to working to, uh, to you know to move out of that working towards again makes sense when you've got a chain of change of ownership yeah. you've got a change of leadership yeah um so some of the things made it's... a lot of sense some of them are a little bit more kind of depressing i suppose or well, not depressing but for example centers that are in highly advantaged communities so they're in that high quintile quintile the, the CIFA quintile five they were more likely to move to exceeding than centers that are in the lower uh, quintile the lower socioeconomic areas of, of Australia so you With know those are things that, uh, yeah uh, uh, are still things I think you know we need to really learn from and think about how we make sure that settings that are in those lower um, areas of community disadvantaged communities are supported because those children and those families deserve high quality education just like children and families that are um, in those higher area demographic I, areas. Yep. yeah yeah um, is that something that came out of the paper um, and that is being addressed or is, is is on the table somewhere? I think, I mean, I, mo a lot of the governments, they know this data, they know that this is important and you can start to see that there is some focus around funding, around uh, communities that are in those lower or lower areas of I, I hate using the word disadvantage that you know they're communities that are experiencing what I think are more complex issues yeah and so yes actually it's a much better we, way yeah so we need we need to be thinking because about the, how the, we how, how we support yeah, those we, in those areas it's usually society society issues that impact rather than the family themselves is that it's, it's the bigger picture um, and we have these lovely children who are all the same no matter where, where they live or where they come from and are so open to, you know, learning and doing better regardless. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, 99.9% .9 of parents want the absolute best for their children and they're doing what they can to do that. And But some are facing, you know, complexity that um, does mean that they do need that additional support or or even around feeling belonging in the center so we know that families from for, that are experiencing complex issues may not feel like that they belong or they may have had poor um, experiences themselves of education so they are worried if they engage in education that we might take their children away from them for example um, that's that's a real fear yes. for some yes. families uh, yeah, and or yes. that they, uh, you know, it's harder for them to get there. They can't afford the bus 
spare. They don't have a car or they can't, they don't have the money to put the petrol in the car. So there are other reasons why they don't attend. It's not just because they don't, um, they, it's not just because they don't it, see the yeah. value of early childhood education. Yeah. And so really what you're saying there, it's out of their control, some of the things that, um, that, that in, hinders them from getting their child to where they need them to be. Um, and it's those supports that, that is that is where we could help families um, do do more, I suppose, or provide more um, options and, you know, d just that community assistance, I suppose, is 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 what we need to look at. Yeah, and and, and we need to listen to the to the educators and the the families that are in those communities because they know what's best. They know actually. These are the types of supports we need. Whereas when we do the top down, well, here's the, you know, this is the funding and this is the program. We know those kind of universal approaches aren't as effective. So it is about um, ensuring that we, that their voices are heard and that they, and that they have an opportunity to lobby and, and governments to see what is the most important ways of how can we deal with this in this community compared to that community? What are the issues in this community compared to that community? So that whole contextualised. Yes still yes, yes. still have a way to go on that mm. we've got a long way to go i think we've you know we're yeah. we're now you know looking at a broad range aren't we we're going from first nations to high high um socioeconomic areas and and everyone in between um and across the states as you said every state mm -hmm. is different every community is different and and how do we apply that um easily all that all that um knowledge and and how do we get that to happen is so your paper is really a first step in that process yeah and um look we that i've seen some amazing leaders in uh areas and they are very clever they you know they look for the money they look for the dollars they look for this random grant um and so they're out there you know kind of chasing the money because they know what they need for their setting and they know that, that that's the only way they get it so there are ways to you know really be strategic and to think outside the box but you do need time to do that you know as a leader so if your approved provider is giving you those resources to be able to fight fight or, or find those those grant yeah. dollars um they're, 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 i've seen some amazing things happening across australia in that in that perspective yeah oh so that's fantastic and that and i suppose that's one of the things that um uh is out there is it is that ability to apply for grants to apply but like you said it's time and you know support yeah and it's knowing now what to write. with that it's a genre yeah knowing Absolutely, and and that's a skill um, as well to, to to know what to do. And 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 one one thing wrong or not even wrong, one thing that you didn't say or didn't do right can impact that mm -hmm. that application. Exactly. It's, yep. it's yes, it's it's not easy, is it? It's not easy. But um, look, overall, you know that that um, with these publications, your audience will be obviously from government ministers right through to educators absolutely absolutely and i and I, are you working on it at the moment oh sorry you go no no you go no that's fine i i, I see that we've got a really great opportunity at the moment you know early childhood is on the agenda it's on the government's agendas both the state and the commonwealth and the territories and so this is our opportunity to to start advocating for the things that we think are really important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and really it starts with that quality, doesn't it? That quality and com and compliance um, and best practice, getting that best mm -hmm. practice in there and sharing our knowledge and sharing our information um, between those who are doing exceeding, right? It's all about what are they doing and how do we get that to the others that are working towards or, you know, trying to, to move to that working towards and getting, getting that information because it is, it is a community, the early learning uh, sector, it's a very small community <laughs> as we know. Um, and, and I think that's where it's really important is that, is that we are sharing that knowledge um, and our expertise 
Um, and, you know, especially, you know, look, your background, Faye, is amazing, you know, and, and to have you as an associate professor coming through and being able to share your expertise um, is, is just fantastic. Um, what I was going to ask you was what are the, what are the big issues for the early, um, early learning sector that, that you can see looking forward? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the evidence is clear. So we know the research evidence has told us lots of things. And so now we need to enact on it. So, for example, we know that infants and young children are affected by significant stress. We know that development is highly interactive. So that's a, that it's not just about our genes. It's about our environment and it's about how um, children are supported in that space. And not just by their primary attachments, their, their parents, but also the uh, caregivers outside of the family. So um, that we know those are important. We know that the first three years of the life of, of a brain's architecture is really critical, but it doesn't stop at three. So, you know, you, our, brain, our brain can be rewired at any age. We know that. So um, we know that basically neglect is probably more of a threat than physical abuse to a child's development. Not that that physical abuse is not okay either, but we know that the neglect is a really really um, is not is not good for children's develop, healthy development. We know that just removing a child from a, a, a dangerous environment doesn't negate that they um, those negative experiences. So it is more than just removal. Um, and sometimes removal is not the right thing. Like it's actually about supporting the families. And as I said, as we were saying before, you know, they're facing complex issues and 99.9% of families are trying to do the absolute best for their children. Um, but, but the thing that I'm probably excited about is that we know that resilience is built around relationships and we in early childhood and outside school hours care, that's what we do and we do really well. We build relationships um, with young children um, and young people and we connect with them. And that's what I think is really important for us to remember as educators is that we really have a critical role to play here in terms of negating some of those other things that might be happening in a child's life and ensuring that when they're with us, that they are, feel, that they are safe, that they are loved, that they feel a sense of belonging, that their culture is recognised, their language is recognised, that who they are and where they come from is, is a part of, um, of that DNA of that setting. Um, but we also know, sadly, that Australia is, you know, the third last in the OC, OECD countries for participation rates in that final year before they go to school so those four-year-olds and we can see yep the federal government has um, made some initiatives around that as well as the state and territory governments we've got New South Wales and Victoria making you know pretty incredible amounts of money that's just been thrown at the early childhood sector around participation of yes. um, four-year-olds and and in Victoria participation of three-year-olds which is really um, very exciting space if you if you work and live in Victoria so to me and that's like that two-year program yeah absolutely and to me this is where we've got our opportunity you know there is money on the table early childhood is understood the evidence is much more understood by our, our policy makers so we need to get in their ears and we need to be talking about to them about what we believe is important what we should be resourcing how that money should be spent so that we are supporting the sector and we're supporting our workforce because we know, you know, that we've got a pretty critical, pretty <coughs> critical issue with our, Sorry. with our educator workforce and, and the burnout and COVID didn't help. I mean, we were already going that no. way, but COVID-19 had, had a big impact on our educators' wellbeing. And yeah, absolutely. Really good people yeah. to the sector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, I think and so really from is, this... Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, say the other thing I think what, what I'm here. <laughs> you go. <laughs> We're having a bit of fun here. <laughs> you go, Faye. I'll stop. <laughs> All right. Well, the only other thing I was going to say is that, you know, it's also, you know, it's really exciting that ASEQ has got a 10 year national strategy for our workforce. Like, we haven't had a national strategy before. Um, yes, the details still got to be teased out and how that will work. But the other thing that I'm really excited about that workforce strategy is that there's an evaluation plan. So it, it, it means that Australian government is going to be accountable to that 
national workforce strategy because they're actually going to evaluate it in 10 years time so i think they're those kinds of opportunities where we now need to get on and get in and and have those conversations with uh the people that um are going to have an influence around that and i suppose the big one that i think is really important is the mentoring the mentoring of our educators and thinking about how we can develop uh programs and support um there's lots of little mentoring programs scattered around australia but what can we do more in a national level to support our educators coming into the sector, those that are studying to be, um, a, you know, a cert three, a diploma or an early childhood teacher, or those who um, have, have got their qualification and are fairly new in our sector. Those first five years we know are really critical. But the other thing that's really interesting in the mentoring space is those that have been in the sector for like the 15, 20 years. What's there for them? What, what, what kind of mentoring can they have to allow them to not only give back to the, to the ones that are coming into the sector, but that they are also feeling like that their cup is, is full as well? Yes, because there's certainly, um, you know, the staffing over the last 12 to 18 months has certainly been, you know, in, in the media and out there. Um, and I suppose those, those ones that have been there for that 15 years plus they're the ones that are still in the in the sector that haven't left or, or whatever they you know or, or retired is to use that knowledge like you said because they really are the mentors um, for those those new uh, lead, educators coming through um, and making sure they're not feeling burnt out or you know um, talking to them and supporting them like you said would be really important. My dream, Paula, my dream, and I and I do um, advocate it wherever I can go, so I'll do it on the podcast today, is that... Absolutely. Day, That's what we're after. What's your dream, Faith? Be- hopefully before, before too long, we will actually have funded pupil-free days for all early childhood services and outside school hours co- services across Australia, just like we have pupil-free funded days in our formal schooling sector so that our staff can come together as a collective because we know professional development is much more effective when we do it together as a team and that then improves the quality. That's what we're focusing on around our quality improvement, which then impacts on the outcomes for young children yeah, in our ECEC and outside school hours care services. So that's my big, my big wish. That's a big dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I look, it's huge really, isn't it? Because of, you know, that you, you think of all the things that, that need to be put in place to get that pupil-free day um, in, the, in the early learning uh, world, I suppose, for parents, families, children, work workplaces. But in saying that, the benefit outweighs not doing it. Yeah, and I, the argument sometimes it's, people say, but, but our services are for families that are working. And I, and I agree with that, but um, families in schools are working, but they manage to rearrange their day or take a day off when it's a pupil free day. So there are ways around it. It's, it's, it's just that unfortunately still in, in ECEC and outside school hours, where often that's what the focus is that we're there for working families when we're actually there for educating young children. Yes. And also sometimes, um, that day off or that afternoon off for a family is has positives as well. Mm. Yeah, and and, so and I'm not I suppose we're but yes, that's my dream. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm I'm just thinking here out loud. Um, is you even looking towards workplaces to support that? Mm. Absolutely, it's, it's a big picture, babe. Some, it's a big dream. Yeah, and some workplaces do some really amazing organizations both like large organizations and small standalone centers they already do this they already have you know a couple of pupil free days at the beginning of the year where the staff just spend time looking at you know as pd so it it is happening so obviously in those places it's funded by the individual center or organization whereas i'm you know thinking that this is something that potentially government should be funding Yes. So look, what I'm hearing from you is let's move forward. But where the voices start from is our educators, is our teachers, is our centre directors and pushing the word up. So pushing the voice through rather than being told what's happening, 
let's hear it from those educators. Now, this is a really out there question, Faye. Is there any, I'm an educator listening to the podcast here today, and I'm thinking, wow, this is fantastic. I have got an idea. I would like to push forward. How do they do that? So this is where you, I, I encourage everybody to join networks. So, for example, join um, a professional organisation. So Early Childhood Australia, for example. I've been a member of Early Childhood Australia since I was 20. Um, th- they're places where you can then plant those ideas at a, at a state branch or, and, and take it up nationally. Or you've got, um, the new, you know, you've got state organisations that are there advocating for you um, so join join a local organisation or start your own network if you think there's a network that needs to be started that's not there um, and find those people to, to do that uh, and, you know, speak out to your politician. You can write a letter to a politician at any time. You can go and most of our local state and federal members have um, those drop-in sessions, you know, the town hall events. Go, talk to them, yes. let them know who you are. That's the way that they will hear the message. And apply for the grants. Yes, absolutely. Apply for the grants <laughs> and and, <laughs> and be, be a voice in your community so that when there are questions around early childhood matters or outside school hours care matters, they'll think, oh, I'll go and see Faye about that because, you know, she's very knowledgeable in this space. <laughs> so, yeah, so kind of put yourself out there, which means you've got to get out of your comfort zone, but it also means then you're more likely to be seen as as somebody to to be um, to to reach out to. And and look and and Faye, you're a great example of someone from a small country. I mean, Eden down the south coast is a small country town, right? That's where you you're looking at. So the the small country town and and where you are and what you've done um, shows that anything's possible. You know, just got to like you said earlier, comfort zone, push yourself out uh out there and um and use use the resources around you to make a better world for our um our children absolutely and now i live in the city and i thought i was a country kid and i thought i was going to be a kindergarten (laughs) teacher in a primary school in a rural setting (laughs) and you've never done it never done it that's amazing (laughs) and 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 in all honesty for 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 the for the greater good of our society that was a great thing for all of us <laughs> you know someone just pushing you more than what you ever thought you were going to do and look where we look where we look what we've got to and um look before we finish up we love to know people's wise words or motivational quotes personal mottos um do you have one mm, i do so and it kind of goes back to the full circle when i first talked about um being out of your comfort zone but it it is about finding your tribe so I feel like every job that I've had in in my career as an early childhood teacher and I still consider myself an early childhood teacher um it was places where I the philosophy fit my thinking um and it allowed me to thrive so not just survive but thrive so I encourage um educators to find their tribe um, and also what I really encourage educators to do is to look outside of your setting for your tribe as well. So your tribe can be in your setting, but you also have a tribe outside. So they may work in another setting. They may be in a totally different role to you. They may live in another state or territory or even another country. Um, but it's about building those connections with your colleagues. And those are the colleagues that you can then debrief with and they will, and you know, you know, it's a safe space and it's not going, and it will remain confidential because sometimes we just need to vent and then we're okay. We don't want, it's a bit like the teenager. They don't want the answer. They just want to, you know, vent at you. And we're a bit the same when we're working with children and families and colleagues. It's, you know, it's, it's a busy, messy place because we're people. Um, And also they help you, they challenge you, which is something that's definitely happened to me over my career. They also help you think about it from another perspective so you don't get stuck in your ways, so you don't stagnate, which I think is really important um, if we're going to provide high-quality education for young children. Uh, and so they challenge you in, in those ways of thinking and learning that um, you may not have thought about. And like I said before, it gets you, you, it helps you get out of your comfort zone and um we know, like the research tells us, when we're reflective, when we're a deep thinker, 
we uh, have a direct, it has a direct impact on the high quality experiences we're providing the children and families we work with. So um, finding your tribe, filling up your cup is, is a really critical part of ensuring that you're doing an excellent job in your, in your everyday work. Wow. Well, yes, absolutely. I can, I can see how um, find your tribe is so amazing. And even as you mentioned earlier, even finding your um, state organisations or your ECAs, it's all about that tribe, um, especially in a community such as the early learning uh, sector, which is, you know, a, a beautiful community to be in. But, but anyway, Faye, thank you so much for your time today. It's actually been a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, and look, that paper sounds amazing. If you can share that link with us and we'll, of course, put all your um, links and socials up so that anyone who would you know, like to know more or reach out to you can do that. And um, we look forward to seeing all those publications. Thank you, Paula, and thank you for letting me talk about what I love to do every day. Thank you.